Okay, so now we can start. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this panel, or should I say willkommen, because we are going to speak about uh, a German concept, or at least a German language concept, the Spitzenkandidat process, uh, which I'm sure you all know, but I will uh, anyway re recall quickly what it is about. Uh, Spitzenkandidat can be translated by lead candidate in English, which is the idea to, to have um, a lead candidate for the European political parties uh, to campaign for the European elections, and then this lead candidate of the party which finish, finishes the first ahead uh, in the elections will become the European Commission president. Um, so the first time it was applied was four years ago in, in 2014. Um, the idea, maybe you would contradict me, but I, I think the idea was very much a personal idea of Martin Schulz, who wanted um, to, to be the Euro European Commission president. And, um, well, we, we could say that it did not go so well for him, if we look at his situation now. Um, but the process is going to be applied again for the next uh, European elections next year. The, the main parties, which are the EPP, the um, Party of European Socialists, the ALDE, the Liberals, or uh, the Greens, they have said they would have a Spitzenkandidat. Um, so there are many arguments for it, for this process. I, I, I will just use the argument put forward by the European Commission in a, in a document published in February. Uh, the Commission said that the Spitzenkandidat process strengthened the connection with the citizens and led the way, opened the way for a more political commission. And also uh, among the, the arguments in favor of this process is that it brings more transparency to the appointment process of the, the head of EU institutions and that it, it fosters some political debate through the campaign ahead of the, of the European elections. Uh, the EU leaders are less keen on that process. Uh, they discussed this in, in a summit in February and they had no official conclusions, but there, there was a statement from Donald Tusk, the, um, the president of the European Council, and he said that the Council could not guarantee in advance that it will propose one of the lead candidates when, it, when they have to, to choose the next European Commission president. And they, they added that there is no automat automaticity in this process. So now, uh, with this panel, we will have a look at this less than a year before the next elections, and there can be several questions. The first one could be, is the Spitzenkandidat process the right way to engage voters to bridge the EU democratic gap and to legitimize the EU institutions? Another question could be, is the Juncker Commission a good or a bad advertisement for the process? Should the Commission really be a political institution, as it claims it should be? And can the Spitzenkandidat process work without transla transnational lists? That has been an issue recently. So on the panel with us, we have on the extreme left or right, depending <laughs> on where we look from, uh, we have Victoria Weinay. Uh, you are a Brussels-based public affairs specialist. On your right, we have Nikolai von Ondarza. You are from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, the SVP, in Berlin. We have also Adelina Marini. You are an editor-in-chief of euinside.eu. So I, I think you're based in Zagreb. The website was founded in Sofia, right? Mm -hmm. And we have Boris Zala. You are a member of the European Parliament uh, from Slovakia and from the Socialist and Democrats group. And I should have, I'm sorry, introduced myself. I'm Eric Morris, editor-in-chief of EU Observer, which is a news website based in Brussels. Um, so to, to start with, um, I would ask you, uh, four years into this, this Spitzenkandidat process with a, a so-called political co commission, we've had enough time 
to look into it and to look at the, uh, the political and institutional uh, consequences of it. So I would ask you how you assess it so far. And I will start with you, Mr. Zala, because you are in the parliament and the Spitzen candidate is linked to the European Parliament elections and you've been on a day-to-day -day basis very close to the consequences of it. So briefly, how would you summarize the, the good and bad sides of, of this? <laughs> From my point of view, the Spitzen candidat in the narrow sense, it's quite a very boring subject, uh, has not a very, very big importance. But when we are putting in, uh, in, the, in the mosaic of the, of the bigger picture, then it is quite very important questions because it is linked or could be linked to the whole institutional reform of the European Union. The origins of the idea was not just, maybe partially, yes, the ambitions of Mr. Mr. Schulz, but uh, the origin was a permanent fight between the European Commission and European Council. That means in the European Union in the structure, which is anomaly, we have two executive powers. We have the Commission and we have the, we have the uh, European Council. Uh, and one legislative power, that is the European, European Parliament. Uh, the idea of Schulz was, okay, the powers was shifting more to the, to the European Council in this time, in 2010, 2011, which was linked to the crisis, the economic crisis in this, in this, yeah, exactly, in yeah. this, in this time. But Schulz was very angry about this and he, he always said, okay, we have uh, again here the uh, uh, Vienna uh, uh, Congress mm -hmm. from the uh, 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 after Napoleonic times, and we don't know that the Vienna Congress, that means the intergovernmental decisions, are again uh, uh, the most powerful body in the European Union because the whole Lisbon Treaty is, is based on the so called communitar principle. I will be very often the, the the expression community, it's just something like a, a cover of a normal federal, federal principle, but in these times nobody was able and uh, so brave to say we want the fed partially the federal structure of the European, mm -hmm. European Union. Mm -hmm. And that so was the idea. Yeah, we'll come later to what can be changed, but um, do you think that this, uh, this balance between the institutions was has been changed by the process. Did you feel it between your previous term and your term now as, a, as an MEP? Would you yes. be happy now? Yes, I think I think so. And I am not going to speak about the content of the real uh, activities of the Commission, but the position under the Juncker's uh, leadership uh, or mastering uh, is stronger be because the Spitzen candidate is linked to the concept of the Commission. Is the Commission to be just uh, in service of the European Council, or is the Commission to be uh, to be a real executive power with their own policy in many different uh, 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 branches, or just? And that was the fight between the service of the Council or the real executive power of the European Union, that means something like a European Union's government. And that is the idea of the Spitzenkandidat. Mm -hmm. That means his legitimacy as uh, a chairman of the European Commission must come from the elections, and then he has the real legitimacy, and he can say, okay, I am enough powerful to, towards the prime ministers in the, in the European Council. Mm -hmm. That is the idea of the Spitzenkandidat. Mm -hmm. Victoria, since you're in Brussels in, uh, and working with many stakeholders, as we say there, and people working closely to this decision process, is it so clear? How, how do you feel that it is working um, mm. on, in the yeah in the day-to-day -day working on the of, of Brussels of the EU? I think the permanent fight mentioned by MEP Zala is still there between the Council and the Parliament, and I think it's just getting worse. We will see it next week at the, the summit that informally the, the member states will again discuss how to proceed with the Spitzenkandidat procedure. And we know that the transnational lists are not going to happen this year. So I believe that whatever the initial objective was of this, this procedure, I'm not sure this is going to work out for the 2019 elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adelina, 
how do you see it from far from Brussels this time? <laughs> Um, I think the issue at first glance seems um, a bit complicated because uh, it's not an easy thing to say um, the, uh, this procedure resolves a specific problem because it all depends on many other things. Um, first, the European Parliament and its purpose is to um, hold the European institutions accountable. Um, the Spitzenkandidaten procedure um, was introduced for another reason as well, and that was after the um, Euraria crisis, when everyone was talking about the lack of democratic legitimacy. However, um, here several processes have um, unfolded. First of all, these days, the European Council is gaining more power. And with the, the, leader's the leader's agenda that Donald Tusk took um, and the leaders adopted, the power balance shifted towards the European Council. On the other hand, uh, this current mandate of the European Parliament um, is as well failing to do the job. If one is listening to the um, hearings of the um, uh, European Council, uh, members and the Commission after EU summits, uh, then one would see the debate is very nationally focused, very uh, rare. Uh, the MEPs are discussing specific decisions that have been taken by the European leaders. More often, uh, MEPs are campaigning uh, for domestic reasons. Um, so, Therefore, the Spitzenkandidat procedure is not solving that problem. Mm -hmm. And that's um, why uh, it was quite timely uh, when the um, French President Emmanuel Macron was um, elected because he uh, brought up the idea of uh, transnational lists, which is supposed to actually bring more democratic legitimacy to the European Parliament because now we have this um, controversy. Uh, on the one hand, it is said that uh, the European political families uh, propose candidates who lead debates and so on and so forth. But how can we elect these people? We can elect them only through the national parties that are members of these political families. We cannot um, elect them directly. So what, for example, if we are not in a quite democratic country where there is no pluralism and that sort of thing? So um, there are some uh, loopholes of democracy throughout the European Union. And it was really amazing how things have turned out to be in the current situation. Uh, the French president practically blocked the uh, Spitzenkandidat with that decision that you um, quoted in the beginning, that there would be no automaticity. And he did that because the European Parliament rejected the transnational list to be enforced mm -hmm. as of 2019. But in yesterday's declaration between Angela Merkel and the French president, there is a commitment that as of 2024, the transnational list would be included. And that would unleash the democratic legitimacy that we've been hoping the Spitzenkandidat mm -hmm. would bring. We'll come later to, to the future and how we can forecast. Uh, Nikolai, the, the, the Spitzenkandidat is something, well, we said it, really new and even in the treaty, there is still, as we, as we saw with the leader statement, there is still some uh, divergence about the interpretation of the article uh, mentioning the, uh, how to appoint the, the European Commission uh, president. So how would you explain why it's so unclear and how it affects the way the EU works and how this, wh what is the implication of adding this process to the, the whole EU construction which is not uh, so new now? Um, I think it's not something unusual for the for the EU. I think in the Lisbon Treaty there's a lot of things that I would call constructive ambiguity, uh, where the member states couldn't clearly agree on one direction and therefore left room in the in the treaties that 
then later on had to be f filled up by political decisions. And you see that in a lot of areas. And I think the, the Spitzenkandidaten principle is, is one of that, which is a very ambiguous article, which, as you said, on the one hand says the, the European Council proposes, and then the European Parliament elects, and nobody really knows beforehand how the power balances mm -hmm. shift in that. But I would say this is not so unusual. We have many EU member states where we have a similar situation where the president or sometimes even the king is then the one uh, who has pr proposes uh, the leader of the political party that gets first the chance to form a government and find uh, the majority in, in parliament. So I think the key to the Spitzenkandidaten principle is not the auto uh, automaticity of the lead candidates becoming commission president. It's the idea that the commission president, the proposal has to find the majority in the European Parliament. And I think yes. we should expect in 2019 the Spitzenkandidat of the largest then party to have the first go at finding a majority in the European Parliament. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he or she is the one who actually gets uh, the majority. So I think this constructive ambiguity is there on purpose and I think it's to be filled by the political decision makers and that there will necessarily be uh, a power struggle again between the, the political parties on the one hand and the, the European Council on the other hand in 2019. Mm. But in a way that means that every five years we have the same questions and the same uh, trading between the Council and the Parliament and uh, is, is that sustainable in the future or does it would we need to 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 make it clearer? Um, I think so it, it won't happen to the same extent. I mean, in 2014, it happened once. We'll see what happens in 2019. But if there are two or three elections afterwards, where one of the lead candidates became eventually commission president, then I think it, it is an established constitutional practice. Um, and I I think if we look at the national level, it's not so unusual. Basically, almost. All EU member states now have fragmented political party system where we have very few member states where there is one party that has the absolute majority and almost all national governments in Europe are the outcome of negotiations between political parties who gets the majority. And it's not even so uncommon anymore that it's not necessarily the leader of the largest political party who is able to form a majority, precisely because we have often five, six, seven, sometimes eight parties which need to find an agreement. And therefore, I, I don't think it's unhealthy for the democratic legitimacy um, of the European Union. I think the unhealthy bit, and we'll, we'll come later, as you said, where we can uh, strengthen it, is the question on how strong is actually the link between the national political party that I vote for and the political party family. So is my vote for, let's say, Anno uh, in the Czech Republic really a vote for the Spitzenkandidat of Alde? Mm -hmm. uh, that, I think, is the weak part, not necessarily the question on who uh, will come out on top in the political negotiations. Mm -hmm. So that makes me come back to, to Adelina and the transnational list in a way because the, you linked uh, the two issues and they are linked. Um, so you mentioned that Merkel and Macron agreed to have this for 20, 24. 24, which is a long way to go, yeah. so it's not sure, but how, do you, how can you be sure that it would uh, make things clearer and uh, the, especially when we look at the democratic gap of the EU. Why is it so important uh, to, to, to have transnational lists? And how can it be done? Because it's not um, because Macron and Merkel agreed today that it can be done in the future. I think that what um, what's important now is uh, what will the outcome of the European elections in 2019 will be and what majorities will form in the European Parliament because um, at that particular mo moment the, the biggest political group, that of the EPP, hopes to remain the dominant power but there are signals that it's possible that they will remain uh, force, but in the same time, other majorities could form, and um, we should also be aware that Euroscepticism is here to stay, populist parties as well, and this is what will actually define uh, whether um, the Spitzenkandidaten procedure will be applied in full force as in 2014, 
or the leaders will have a say as well. And this will give us um, a hint and a basis how to proceed forward. Uh, and then, if the next European Parliament is worse in terms of your skepticism and populism than it is now, as such expectations already exist, then the transnational list will come up as a solution. Because on this list, there could be different people with pro-European views uh, on the same list and they will be put forward by their ideas and they will bring up um, the uh, EU issues in the European uh, Parliament elections because we know from experience and I know it, uh, I guess it's in all member states, when there are European elections, um, the EU issues are rarely dominant. It is mainly national issues that are being discussed, which is not fair and which actually erodes the role of the European Parliament afterwards. Mm -hmm. Boris Zala, there was a debate about the transnational list in the Parliament, uh, I think it was in February or so before this EU leaders meeting. Uh, why isn't it obvious for MEPs to have these lists? Why is, is there no unanimity about it? <laughs> it, is, it is quite complicated questions because the delegations from the different countries and from the different political groups have a different reasons for, for, for it. From my point of view, it is because it is very, very imperfect, imperfect in, in, in the one, one, one hand. And in the other hand, it is not in a real environment which is changing and politically reform the European Union. Uh, all these things we are speaking about, from my point of view, are a very small steps which are just hinting that we are coming to some European level decision making, that's mean to European government, to European legislative body, and not a real steps uh, speaking, speaking uh, uh, uprightly. Uh, we are not an international organization as we are listening it very often from our British colleagues because they're always speaking about the European Union as an international organization. In reality, after the Lisbon Treaty, we are a co-state. We can have an argument if we are more federal, more, more uh, confederative. Uh, uh, we have some, in, some trades from one. In some, some other things, we are absolutely uh, strong, integrated uh, uh, state, more than Canada or maybe United, United States. And in other things, and exactly in the things of the state institutions, we are very free and we are on the, on the halfway. And to make these small steps, to make something like a transnational list or the Spitzenkandidat, that is something which we are, we are trying to show that we have a good will to be more than we are. But the normally, uh, normally functioning institutions are the institutions which are federal or confederal, doesn't matter, but, but with absolutely clear political and legal system. And we are still making the small steps. The one, one example is, as, as you mentioned, uh, the, the position of the Macron. The Macron is saying, OK, I, it's not a problem to have a transnational uh, uh, list, but in 2024, because his uh, political party is not a member of the, any group in the European Parliament, and he knows that that is necessary to have a time how to settle his position in the European Parliament and then he is going to see what to do in, from this position. And that is every, in every small things we are making the tensions between the European institutions and between the national states for every small things and there is permanently threat that we are going to disintegrate it itself. And it is going to be a, until we are not saying, no, we need a fully-fledged confederative system of the, of the political, political uh, life. And if we are not going to make these steps, we are permanently in the crisis situation because we are uh, not international organization and we are not a normal state. 
And that is the permanent, permanent tensions uh, uh, inside, and that will be a very interesting topic about the Spitzenkandidat, because, and you are absolutely right, because the continental political system is based on the majority, and when the majority in the parliament is proposing the, the chairman of the commission, that is a normal legal process for the executive power. There is not necessary to have a Spitzenkandidat as a person, as a, as a concrete name, that is the, maybe, maybe the British, British customs, because they always say who is not on the, on the candidate list can't be uh, uh, in executive power. Mm -hmm. The continental tradition is absolutely different. That is the conflict of the interest. Contrary, who is on the, in the parliament or who is in the, in the uh, executive power is not necessary, but must be forbidden to be a part of the, of the parliament, because that is the conflict of the, of the interest, to be, to be parallelly in the, in the parliament and in the executive, executive power. Mm -hmm. um, Victoria, do you think there is a, I would say popular, but it may be too narrow, but a demand for that? Because we discussed this institutional process, but if, if you are not an MEP, not a commissioner, not a member of the government, just a voter, uh, as Adelina mentioned, people vote nationally. So is, is this really important to have this um, EU debate and uh, EU-wide campaign to have this Spitzen candidat and transnationalist? I think the majority of the people who are going to vote next year in May have no awareness about the fact that they are also voting for the Spitzenkandidaten. So I think this is one of the biggest problem and that's lack of communication from the EU side. And I think, in my personal view, the Commission should be politically independent. So therefore, the, the Commission, the President should come at, from the political parties, right, of course, have the backup because the, the Parliament needs to vote on that, but at the same time should be independent. Clear it is, I think. And um, if we look ahead to next year, uh, I, I, I see the, the, the question, uh, should the EU go further and linked, link the elections of a joint EU president to the, to the outcome of the EP elections? So um, I don't know if this refers to a joint EU Council and EU, EU Commission <laughs> president, which is a point I wanted to, to, to ask you about. But we see that there is some kind of... Um, of uh, enthusiasm here about, uh, about the ID. Um, what would be your forecast for next year um, of what will happen given that uh, MEPs want the, the, the process, leaders um, want to keep their hand on, on, the, on the appointment. Um, the Commission went, came out with this idea of merging the two positions of Council and, uh, and Commission. Of what you hear and see these days, what do you think can happen next year? So what we know is that Juncker is not going to be the next president because he is not going to run. Mm -hmm. We have a few candidates from all political parties, but what Adelina also mentioned, right now it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen because it's not anymore given that the EPP is going to have the majority in the parliament. So therefore, whoever they put as a Spitzenkandidat, and we cannot say that that is going to be the new president of the Commission. And who is going to be the president of the Council, again, it's not clear. Joining, joining the two forces, some would say, yes, it's a straightforward decision and we should go ahead with that. However, I think the legitimacy of the Commission is that it's an independent body from the Council. It's the initiator of the legislations. Of course, it gets the input from the Council, it gets the input from the, from the European Parliament. Nevertheless, in my view, it should be independent and the President as well. Mm -hmm. um, Boris Zala, in in Brussels and in the Parliament, but also outside the Parliament, do you, how do you feel also the, uh, the the political and institutional willingness to 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 make it permanent this process? Do you feel that people want to keep it or to kill it? It's unclear the situation in the European Parliament because everybody is a little bit speculating uh, about the concrete persons. Uh, who is the appropriate, who, who less. 
Then is the question that they are not just uh, about the, the president of the commission, that is the problem who is the president of the parliament, then who is the, the president of the council, and maybe then can be a play uh, how to make a coalition in the, in the parliament and to, to make some, some uh, compromises about the, about the, about the position. Uh, I think, and I agree absolutely with you, that this whole question will have no any impact on the decision of the of the of the voters because it is quite a speculative uh, uh, whole whole system. Uh, I think there is no no enough braveness, uh, uh, even in in uh, Merkel or Macron's uh, discussion, to say, okay. We are going to have a normal political system. We have a European Parliament, we have a European Commission, and we have a European Council, which we can change, for example, for the Senate. It can be a classical Senate when you are looking at the American system. The representatives of the, of the member states, they are creating a Senate, and the Senate can have a lot of uh, 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 enforcement and a lot of powers, but not the absolute power. That means there must be some voting and some majority. Mm -hmm. Very good example, paradoxically, is the former uh, Czechoslovak uh, uh, arrangement of the, of the federal parliament, where it was two, two parts, so-called uh, House of the People and the House of the Nations. It was not working very good because there was just two two nations uh, uh, inside and was not, not, not equitable in this moment, but the system was very effective and the uh, and, uh, uh, House of Nation Nationality, Senate or House of Nationalities, have some very strong blockage powers. But was, it was a legislative body and not the, the permanent conflict between the two executive powers like now in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And the every Spitzenkandidat can be blocked on the European Council, every. If there is not an agreement or consensus in the European Council, then no one Spitzenkandidat uh, has a chance to be, to be a chairman of the Commission. Mm -hmm. So is it something also close to the German system with the Bundestag and Bundesrat or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or not? How would you make this comparison between what could mm -hmm. become the council, what is the commission, and how we could have clear institutions with a clear div, uh, role for each, and something that is clear when people have to vote for the uh, for the European elections. I think it's not necessarily comparable to one certain national system. I think what we have on a general level is that with the Spitzenkandidat we have a more sort of direct connection between the parliament and the executive uh, in the commission and that the commission president and the whole commission needs to build up on a majority in, uh, in the European parliament but at the same time needs to find support for all legislative proposals in a sort of second chamber with, with the council. Uh, but what I would clearly reject in that area is uh, that the commission needs to be apolitical or independent. Uh, in my point of view the, the commission is a very political institution and the right of initiative is not just this sort of administrative function, it's an inherently political right. Um, and I think uh, the, the movement of the Commission uh, towards a more political body has not just been during the Juncker Commission, it's something that happened over the, the recent year and for me it's a genie that is out of the bottle. Um, and I think the, the question we should more ask ourselves is, okay, we have a political commission here um, and it's going to be tied in the future more to the European Parliament. What are some of the functions of the Commission that require a neutral actor? like scrutiny in the Eurozone, like perhaps rule of law, that we, that we should take away from the political commission to a more neutral body so that um, there's not this inherent tension between a political commission tied to a majority in the European Parliament that is clearly party politically influenced, but that at the same time has sometimes pretends to act politically neutral on rule of law and other issues. So, so I would reject that the Commission needs to be in independent, but rather propose that we split some of the functions away from the Commission uh, that is a political body in my, my point of view. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there was a good question from, I, I don't know if we can see it now, uh, from uh, Andrzej Hoska about the, yeah, how about the danger that this process would now the field of potential candidates? Which prime minister would stand down and dedicate months to a campaign? I guess uh, without the, the guarantee to, to become the, the commission's president. So maybe Adelina, if you, if you want to answer that and your colleagues too. Well, it's a decision of the Prime Minister, after all, uh, and it depends how this will unfold, because currently the Spitzenkandidaten uh, procedure uh, needs improvement, actually. Uh, but I would, uh, I'd like to make a remark um, here on the politicalness of the Commission um, and about um, whether it should be political in terms of uh, rule of law or some other issues that we've uh, noticed in the past years. Um, as a matter of fact, although it seems like a contradiction, but this politicalness is um, mitigating the conflict that is between the member states and some cultures they perform. Otherwise, if the commission is very strict and it was in the past blamed for being too technocratic, this raises uh, serious tensions and uh, fuels uh, populist and anti-European uh, moods in, in the member states. Um, and another issue I think is important as well. Um, in the case of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, who actually made this European Commission even more political, there is another a uh, small detail, and it was that he actually didn't want to be president of the Commission. He wanted to be a president of the European Council, and in the first years of his presidency, he actually competed with Donald Tusk. Well, even today, when he's yeah. uh, even today, asking leaders to come on Sunday yeah, to the Commission. Yeah, at every European Council, and it's getting worse, actually. The last European Councils were like a bullfight between uh, Juncker and Tusk. So it is not necessary that the Spitzenkandidaten procedure would evoke more politicalness. It, de it depends on the person. But what I don't like with the Spitzenkandidaten procedure as it is now is that uh, it cuts the link you mentioned it between the national electorates and the European realities. And currently, the EPP is uh, trying to block any competition from any other sides just to keep its dominance and it's uh, uh, forgiving all its members all their crimes and uh, guilds just to keep itself floating which I think is wrong and it, 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 this system should be improved so that it could give people real, real say in, in, in such a procedure. Mm -hmm. Nikolai, you wanted to add something? Yes, I wanted to add something on the original question, which I think was something that was brought up in the UK very strongly when they were critical of the Spitzenkandidaten. Um, and I just wanted to point out, I would challenge everybody saying that any commission president since Jack Delors before Juncker was a particularly strong choice, even though there were previous heads of state um, and government. If we look at Santa, Prodi, Barroso, um, none of them were particularly strong uh, presidents of the European Council, and I would say that Council or Commission mm, uh, of the of the Commission. commission yeah. Sorry for that. And I would say that a candidate who has went through uh, the election, even though they are not as known as national candidates, uh, I would still say that Juncker and Schulz, at the end of the day, were probably more known throughout the European Union than any previous candidates yes. for the European yeah, exactly. Commission before then. And, and I would expect that in 2019. Um, they will probably not be able in, to, to campaign in each and every village around the EU, but they will be more known uh, than, my, than national heads of states of ma minor European countries. Mm -hmm. And so in comparison to what was previously, I think there is an advantage to the system. That makes me think of another question is, if you're a prime minister uh, or a recent former prime minister, which is the most interesting, to be president of the commission or of the council? Um, and which one could be the most prestigious? Boizala. <laughs> it depends from the nature of, of, the, of the person, of course. <laughs> the president of the European Council is more 
a man who is negotiating and making some consensus between very differ different uh, points on not just in opinion <coughs> but in real interests of the states and the interests of the states can encounter in a very strong strong uh, uh, power and at this moment i am absolutely sure that the differences on the national level it's going to be deeper and deeper and uh, the, the whole geopolitical field is coming back to the European Union, which I think will be a very big catastrophe because the European Union is based on the, on the uh, minimizing the geopolitical differences within the European Union. Now, the many countries, not just the Poland, then the Poland is a very strong. When I mentioned that the Poland, uh, uh, they proposed to have a uh, American base in the in the Poland, and they didn't propose it uh, uh, in framework of the NATO, but on the bilateral relations with the United States. Maybe we will, after this session, uh, 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 listen to the to the American position in this in these questions towards the Central Europe. I think the geopolitical factor is going to strongly disintegrated European, European Union and that is very strong things and in this moment the, the President of the Council will be very important person to find what is more common and uh, less, less uh, dividing between the, between the countries. And the second thing is about the Commission, I absolutely agree with Nikolai, uh, because the Juncker, and Juncker is surely not somebody who I am uh, adoring, but, but uh, he really changed the commission to the political and executive body and not the service of the national, national states. And he used very strongly, with the support of Timmermans as well, the Lisbon Treaty. And he used most the ambiguous differences in the, in the Lisbon Treaty in, in the favor of the European Commission. And I am not sure that the next next uh, uh, chairman of the of the commission will be so strong as Juncker's was mm -hmm. the case. There was a, a, a follow-up question uh, on, uh, kind of uh, on that from uh, by Jakub M. Which would increase legitimacy of the EU the most? Directly elected president of the commission or of the council? Um, who wants to, to, to answer that? Even if it's not on the table yet, but as a theoretical question, uh, Delina. Well, I think the roles are different. Um, the uh, president of the European Council is actually important for those who are in the European Council. So it's probably uh, still up to them to, to choose who would better uh, be able to uh, balance in between them. Whereas the president of the European Commission, as the so-called guardian of the treaties, needs to be more accountable and needs to be a more visible figure because that's what the job that he or she does. And um, with the um, deepening of integration in various uh, areas like it's happening now in the Eurozone and the defense and foreign policy security as well, it will be really important that person which will be at the head of the European Commission to have real uh, legitimacy and be represented because after all um, it answers to the European Parliament but it also answers to uh, in a way to the European citizens at large whereas the um, European Council is a bit more close um, format. Yes, Victoria. But are we there yet? Do you think that the people, the normal EU citizens, are, are really aware of the role of the Commission and the Council, so they would be able to judge who would be the right president for the Commission? I agree with your arguments, but I'm just not sure that the maturity and the awareness about the EU and its role, uh, sorry, the institutions and, its, and their roles within the EU are really in the mind of the, of the average EU citizens. I'm not sure either. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a um, real deficit. By the way, th th this is the sin of the European political parties because now they realize it after Macron appeared and started yeah. to yeah. threaten them with the transnational list because they never tried to bring, to go to the member states, I mean the leadership actually, to go to the member states 
debates and talk. Uh, they just, you know, support them for elections and this sort of thing. But um, it's really important what you say, the president, to be more visible in the capitals and towns and city halls. Mm. Nikolai, and then I will have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I wanted to add two, two points on that. On, uh, I agree with both of you that we are not yet, there yet, but the question is how can we get there? And I think European elections with Spitzenkandidaten are a real important instrument to get there. If we look at the Eurobarometer um, questions on how much influence do you think for the citizens do you have on European decisions, we see a pattern Then, in each year of the European elections, the number of EU citizens who feel that they have an impact on the EU decisions go significantly up. Um, and I think therefore uh, we can only get there if we have European elections where we have more prominent uh, candidate. And, and that brings me to my, my second point, the the question on should there be a direct election of the European Commission or Council President and I'm not sure I agree with that because I think it would throw around the European political system too much mm -hmm. and concentrate too much power on one person that would be directly elected. So I actually think that the transnationalist would be a good halfway mm -hmm. between that. I mean, the German Spitzenkandidat actually comes from top candidate, the top candidate of a list. Um, and so I think, uh, sort of unlike the rest of the EPP, Merkel has a rather, she has a very analytical mind. And I think she understood recently that to make Spitzenkandidaten work, you need to have a list where the Spitzenkandidat is actually at the Spitze of a list. Um, and therefore, I think this system can only truly work if we have a transnational list where at least citizens around the EU can make the vote for for the directly for the list where the Spitzenkandidat is the, the top at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. You had a quick yeah, remark yeah, and then yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, just just short from the point of view of the citizens, the most important will be the person which is the counterpart of the American president, of the Chinese president, of mm -hmm. the Russian president, because the people are are aware about the real power when you have the power with somebody who is your counterpart. That is the still speculation who is the real leader of the European Union. It is a Merkel mostly or it is a, a Macron. Uh, one very strange thing when you remember these photos when the Merkel is uh, uh, standing against. To the, but everybody was looking at the, <laughs> at the Macron because Macron was speaking but just the pose of, 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 of Merkel was very, very important. That means we are still in the very, and I'm angry a little bit about it, we are speaking about so minutious things and we don't have a real power structure uh, in the European Union uh, uh, settled in a normal, normal way. And that is the reason why the people are permanently looking that somebody else is the, is the real power person in the European Union and not the president of the Commission or the president of the, of the Council. That is quite a tragedy for the European Union. So, Victoria, <laughs> you, 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 no, you mentioned the, the communication. So, what do you think should be changed by the institutions uh, to explain who is doing what and ahead of the elections? And, because there are many, many um, reproaches made to the, the institutions on the way they, they communicate. So if you had some advice for them. <laughs> advice, I'm not sure. But I think in the last five years, the Juncker, com four years, sorry, the Juncker Commission really made a great effort in, in raising awareness of the, of the work of the Commission and also the other institutions as well, communicating directly to the citizens, using social media, so being very interactive. And I think that really helped. It really worked out. I think this is a long process. So this is just needs to be continued. And then I also know that and the Commission as well spend a lot of money in the member states campaigning to, to make the people know what they are doing, what the money is spent on basically, and what the commissioners themselves are doing. So this needs to be continued, the awareness is, needs to be there, and then maybe by 2024 we will be there that the transnational list would work out and also maybe the directly elected president of the Commission. Um, I see another question. How does the EU take into account, no, take, uh, takes account of the demographic difference between voters and their votes in national and European elections? Uh, who asked these questions so we could uh, make it more precise? No? Maybe it's from abroad. Um, so, 
Well, let's, if someone have, has another question that you could ask directly, yes. Um, the initial purpose... There's a microphone. Uh, the initial purpose of Spitzenkandidat process was to strengthen the legitimacy of uh, the President of the Commission. But as already mentioned, there is a huge gap in the link chain of legitimacy between EU citizens and, uh, and the President. Um, the Spitzenkandidat is proposed by European parties, but the European parties themselves uh, do not compete in European Parliament elections. And they are in fact prohibited uh, from uh, competing in EP elections. Um, uh, so, I think that uh, instead of a very complicated solution with the uh, uh, transnational candidate list, it would be much simpler to simply let, uh, op let's open the EP elections for European political parties and let's, uh, um, uh, let's, uh, let's them decide uh, whether they want to compete in EP elections alongside national political parties or instead of them, and let's uh, let's uh, let's put it up to them whether they actually want to close the legitimacy gap, which is currently quite serious. If you have a look at uh, at the Spitzenkandidat process, because as I already mentioned, uh, and it's probably also not just a problem of legitimacy, but also maybe of law, because the law says that, um, uh, that the President of the Commission, uh, that the selection process should take into account the results of, uh, of the EP elections. But who actually won the EP elections? Uh, I don't think EPP, <laughs> European People's Party, won the elections because it was not on the ballot box. So maybe it's not just a simple, not just a question of legitimacy gap, but maybe also uh, a legal problem <laughs> for, for, um, uh, for European political parties. And my question is, is there a discussion in the European Parliament, actually, and within the European political parties to actually compete in the EEP elections, uh, whether they have uh, the courage to actually put their skin into the fire? Mm. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I am very happy to hear that. Because the, the real solution, the first step, should be to have a European political parties, and then we have a, have a list for the European political parties, and then the discussion about the trans uh, 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 national list is out of the of the of the debate, uh, and it will change the whole situation in the European Parliament as well and in the institution. But it is not very much possible because because the the national parties. The European parties, for example, the, the Party of European Socialists, is creating from the 28 parties from the national state, and it has no uh, uh, any legitimacy uh, uh, out of this party. It's just what this party are, are deciding there, the, the PES is doing. Nothing special, nothing on the European level. Uh, there is no, no any, any special, special power for, for, for these activities. That means to change the political parties, and from my point of view, I think the real step would be when just the European political party can make the candidate list to the European Parliament and not the national parties. But we are very far from this So position. you're implying that national parties are preventing the European parties which they form to run into the elections. Yes. It's, it's yes. still... Uh, um, narrow interest of national parties. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I agree. To, They're yeah. trying to dominate and to uh, squeeze the, the space and kill any competition they yes. might have. I think you bring up a, a, a really important point because I think for all the institutional reforms we can make with transnationalists or directly elected uh, president of the European Commission, I think the key would be if the European political parties engage much more seriously in the, in the European elections directly. And we've seen that. Uh, I think a good indication in 2014 was the difference between Germany, where the Spitzenkandidat, both from both sides, made a more serious engagement in fighting the elections with each other. I mean, both spoke German. There were additional TV debates between, between them, and there were several surveys uh, showing that uh, the SPD, for instance, got more support in the European elections compared to national elections. 
due to them the popularity of, of Martin Schulz, while in other countries like in the UK the Labour Party didn't specifically said we don't want Martin Schulz campaigning in the UK. I think in the Netherlands uh, the Christian Democrats said uh, we want to conquer as sort of a small profile as possible. So I think the more important reform would be not necessarily them campaigning against each other directly on the, on the national level, but the national parties deciding to use the Spitzenkandidaten in their national campaign. So actually put whoever is the Spitzenkandidat on their poster and, uh, and on their, their campaign material. And there is a, an interesting change in the current debate about the changes for the EU electoral law. Um, the Council just agreed a change that member states have the possibility but not the obligation to put the names of the European political parties also on the ballot box. Uh, so we might see next, next year whether in some member states actually the names of the European political parties will be on the ballot box so that for the first time European citizens will actually see it on, on their voting box. But this is sort of all baby steps uh, in a long, long way. You mentioned that uh, Juncker and Schulz were speaking German and, and if we look at the other candidates, we had Verhofstadt who's Belgian, so Juncker and Luxembourg, Schulz, German, and the Greens, it was uh, Skakeler and José Bové, French and German. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the core Europe, the founding countries speaking French, German, basically, and English. Do you think that um, having to, to choose a lead candidate who would be campaigning in all Europe makes it more difficult to choose someone from the east of Europe, of the EU, of a small country which is not a funding uh, country, does it, uh, in a way, it's like the question of does it narrow the choice of candidates, not this time uh, because of prime minister, but because it would be re politically risky to take, I don't know, a liberal Estonian or um, a Bulgarian socialist to put uh, as a choice for French, German, or Italian voters. Uh, who wants to answer, answer that? I just, know it's difficult. Re, re, not, not, not so much. Uh, it's possible, of course. There must be the activities of maybe the some regional, regional uh, uh, states or uh, cooperation. For example, the Social Democrats from the Central European uh, uh, Visegrad for countries proposed Maros Shevchovic for the Spitzenkandidat uh, uh, on the, on the uh, SND group. Uh, we will see the result. I think the Shevchovic is quite, uh, uh, as a person, is a quite uh, 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 very good equipped candidate for this, for this position, but I am not sure, I am not sure what will be the development, the situation in the, in the SND group uh, uh, in the European Parliament and the PES. As a, as a political political party, we will see this this competition, uh, but it's possible. Surely, it is possible. It's the activity of the different different blocks. Um, another question: Should the yeah should the Spitzenkandidat of the different parties not be designated primary uh, through primary elections? This could strengthen legitimacy and public interest in the designation. So can we imagine months of primary elections yeah. like in the US, Victoria? It's, it's a waste of time. That, that will end up uh, having elections for years. And then by the time we, we have an, an, an elected uh, president of the, uh, of the commission, then we have to start the procedure again. So I don't think that's... that's uh, and primary election within what? Yeah, within well, the national indeed. political parties yeah. or the European political parties, it's quite... Well, there actually was such a thing in 2014. Yes. The Greens, they had primaries and it was really, in my view, a very good uh, example and it didn't take that much time. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, in the EPP as well, uh, there were various candidates competing. It was not just the EPP itself uh, had to choose among several candidates. Barnier was uh, one of them. Um, so some sort of primaries already exist and I think it's a good idea because for the European political parties as such, because since they do not uh, participate in the elections in the member states, this is a good way to find the balance between the members of the political parties. Mm -hmm. Do you think it should be the duty of the Spitzenkandidaten to visit and campaign in every EU member state? 
uh, because I, I think like Juncker didn't go to uh, the eastern part of the EU when he campaigned, and he took a long time <laughs> when he was president to, to do it. Nikolai. Um, I think it should it should be part of uh, part of the campaign. I think Juncker had this this Juncker bus where he he drove around the EU, and I think he actually did manage to to visit. I, I remember reading an academic article that he visited something like 20, 26 of the twenty eight member states. Mm -hmm. Obviously, didn't go to the UK, the only country where the EPP doesn't have a real member uh, member political party. And so I I think. Um, if you take the Spitzenkandidat seriously, they have to campaign in all, all of the 27 or 28 um, EU member states. And therefore, I think uh, you mentioned the language barrier will probably be one of the biggest difficulties, uh, even if the system is established. Um, I mean, the best European politicians speak something like four or five uh, languages, so I don't think there will be anyone able to speak um, all of the local uh, languages, so they will invariably, to some extent, always address more the elite than they will address the, the European citizen. And these uh, the, the de electoral debates that were on, on television in, in 2014, uh, I remember they were done in English, and Tsipras, so the Spitzenkandidat from the left, was the only one who spoke not in English. Um, and I think he had a clear disadvantage out of that, because the others, I mean, we're speaking English here, we don't have a translation between us, it's just a much more direct engagement, and um, I think to have a real, um, I think there was somebody recently in Brussels, to have a real electoral campaign, uh, you also have to be able to say nasty things about each other. It can't just be a boring campaign where you speak on sort of rational issues, it has to be a real political fight, and the political fight has to be conducted in one or two languages, it can't just sort of be in 20 languages at the same time, so I think this is something that's a challenge for the Spitzenkandidat to actually engage in a real political uh, battle where they throw uh, nasty things at each other and, and try to directly compete with each other, not just on a sort of program level. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, because if we look at uh, the last election, so the argument was the main party is the EPP, so he gets the, the commission, but the losing candidate got the parliament. And then there was this grand coalition with EPP and so SND uh, making most of the legislation together. So you mentioned this uh, consensus culture in the, in the EU. How can we campaign really um, project against project when after we are bound to work together and find compromise all the time, including in, in the council as well? Maybe from an MMP, MEP point of view, first. Mm. <laughs> I didn't get really your questions, to be, to be frank. Uh, what is the core problem of... If you campaign EPP against uh, PES, yes. SND, and you say uh, my project is better and my candidate, uh, yes. the candidate of the main party w will have to get the commission, and then the losing party and even the losing candidate becomes the president of the, of, the, of the parliament. So the loser still gets something uh, in a parliament where his party doesn't have the majority. And then you have the grand coalition with the two parties working together. This, it's difficult to, to, to be against each other in the campaign and then govern together, if I can make it simpler. Yeah, yes, but I, I don't see it as a very big, very big problem that happens on the national level as well in the national parliaments because you always must find a compromise to create a majority in the, in the parliament and the compromise means that somebody will lose something and somebody will gain, but altogether they, they will gain, gain the whole, whole position. But if you allow me, I am coming back to the problem of the language because I think that is quite quite very and very important uh, uh, and I don't want to forget of it. Uh, I think it's quite tragic that we don't still have in the European Union a one language which is the official language. And it doesn't mean to, to push down the other languages, but we absolutely need it because when we want to be a one body, 
we need to have a one common language. We can speak our mother language, we can speak the official language of the European Union, and we can speak the third language, which is not so a big problem. When I remember, for example, I can mention the South Africa, then in South Africa, the 90% of the people are trilingual, and they don't have any problem to be a trilingual. Why the Europeans uh, are going to have a problem, and especially the young generation, not like me, I started to learn English when I turned 50, uh, 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 which is, I think, visible on my, on my expression, then I am not so prompt and uh, uh, not, not so ingenious in the, in the using of the Speak language. Speak better than some but commissioners. But when I am comparing with, <laughs> <laughs> with, my, with my daughter, which the English is something like her second mother language and has no problems. Why we are not going to make a step and to make the English uh, the official language of the European Union? And I will see it a very good retaliation to the, towards the Britons. Now when you are leaving, the English is coming to be a, our official, official, official it's language. It's also neutral. It's not the language and of any member it's state. Neutral. It's yeah. neutral yeah. because there is no answer. one can be jealous <laughs> within the European Union. No of the Germans, not the French, not the Spanish, because the Spanish is a very important language when I am compared in the world, worldwide uh, 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 position. But now is the time to speak absolutely openly uh, and urgently about, this, about these questions. And then we have a common language, and I think for the young people it's not a problem, and it's a question of 10 years. Mm -hmm. the, 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 Maybe 80 percent of the young generation, in, after 10 years, are able to speak to speak uh, uh, English. It's not not a problem, and other two other languages as well. Then the Spitzen candidate or the candidate for the European Council, which can be a whole European candidate, had an open space for his campaign. But when there is not this, the people are handicapped. So it's a note for the organizers for next year, just after Brexit, which should be the, <laughs> the official language. Uh, do we have another questions? question in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, may have a brief one because it's already been partly hinted to. But, uh, you know, historically speaking, our uh, commission was definitely combining, let's say, redistributive and regulatory powers, um, you know, and, uh, the right to initiative, but also, you know, guardian of the treaties, uh, competition policy, uh, rule of law issues. So, connecting this to the politicization of commission that definitely has not started with special candidate in process, uh, but has been strengthened by it. Uh, over the last four years, uh, do you think that the Spitzenkandidaten process uh, has harmed the credibility of regulatory powers and guardian of treaties powers of the Commission? Because, well, if you follow the Czech discourse, uh, the infringement procedure because of, uh, uh, as regards the uh, relocation mechanism, some of the politicians said, well, you know, this is the unfair political pressure of the Commission uh, on us. You may have the same, as I said, in the field of competition. Uh, you may have this, you know, in, in, in Poland, that this has been part of the discourse. You know, this is again uh, a different political majority trying to, you know, squeeze us out because we're not the same, uh, the same party. So has the process uh, undermined the credibility of these, let's say, more regulatory powers of the Commission, uh, and Nikolai already hinted to it, and should we therefore establish different agencies, so basically squeeze out some powers of the Commission and establish new agencies, you know, for competition, uh, police, for law of law, for, you know, the guardian of treaties, for, you know, infringement procedures, and so on. Who wants to take that one, Nikolai? <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is the view in many member states and the national governments that the political com commission has been losing credibility. Uh, you mentioned rule of law. I think in Germany it's mostly about the surveillance and scrutiny in the Eurozone. So if you ask the, the German Ministry of Finance, they're very critical of the uh, commission and always quote something. I think the saying of Juncker on because it's France, uh, why, they, why they weren't more uh, strict with France on 10 years of, uh, in the deficit uh, procedure and therefore I really think the solution is to outsource some of these uh, some of these uh, competences of the Commission where a more neutral function um, is necessary. And I think one area where this actually works quite good is uh, competition, uh, who seems to me being quite firewalled within, within the European Commission, firewalled away from the other areas, um, where I think the Commission 
has not lost the credibility. Um, and I think this is necessary on, uh, on other areas, including rule of law and, and in the Eurozone. I'm not sure it's the Spitzenkandidat as such that is causing this problem because even in the Barroso Commission there were a lot of cases, especially in the European mm -hmm. semester, where the Commission was making concessions to Spain, to, to France uh, very often, to Italy many times. To Germany. To Germany as well. Um, the situation w w with uh, Poland is very obvious, especially when uh, uh, compared to the situation in Hungary. But I'm not sure it's the Sp Spitzenkandidat and as such. It's because the members of the Commission are also members of political parties. Uh, this could be uh, a problem uh, at some point, and this uh, problem will persist no matter if the commission will be uh, the commission president will be elected via a Spitzenkandidat procedure or not. Thank you. A last question, and then we'll we'll finish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dina Chandrashnaj from Talos.eu. If you could just check the first question. Uh, so essentially, should there be a Spitzenkandidat in debate that would be broadcast live and online through the member state? public broadcasters. I know that in a uh, opinion editorial for Spiegel there has been the argument that there should be a European public broadcaster, but since we lack that, potentially this would be a way to broadcast in all 24 official languages the debate so that citizens, when they're voting, can make up their mind of which political party to support and take that into account. Well, Thank you very much. We have a journalist on the panel. Yeah, in 2014 there was such an attempt where all public televisions who were part of the EBU uh, broadcast some of the debates, unfortunately not all of them, but some of the debates. The Euronews as well were uh, publicly broadcasting that. But I agree that it should be more. It should be more, and um, if all speak English, it would be easier for translation, but it's also possible to be translated in different languages. As it happened, uh, Nikolai mentioned with Tsipras, Tsipras didn't speak English at the time. Uh, but the real impact is maybe on the one percent of the of the citizens of the European Union, not not more of this of this mm -hmm. whole European European uh, uh, discussions and debates, not more. Just a personal note on that: I was in in France at the time, or well, I'm still in France in Paris, and I remember speaking with um, uh, someone at France Television, and basically what they were saying is that. No way we are going to put this kind of debate uh, at prime time. No one will watch. So they just put it on the website. If you want to watch it, go on the website. There was no way they would take the time to, to, to broadcast it. It's yeah. just not an, even for a public broadcaster. So uh, they would need some kind of political willingness to that, but also you cannot oblige the, uh, even public TV TVs to do that. Well, we've run out of time. We made it <laughs> with this uh, sexy topic. Thank you for your interesting <laughs> questions. Thank you for your enlightening answers. And, um,